Hello, everyone. Welcome back to another somewhat delayed episode of The War Report. And we have quite a bit of news to cover. There has been what seemed to have been a domino effect across Europe. So, of course, we have Boris Johnson's pending resignation once the Conservative Party can nominate a replacement for him. The Prime Minister of Estonia has stepped down after her very brazen statements just since the beginning of the conflict in Ukraine, just really trying to portray the Baltic states and Estonia in particular as this great bulwark of defense against some sort of Russian aggression or Russian invasion. And, of course, you can also look at that with some of the Lithuania stuff and the spillover with uh, the restrictions on Kaliningrad. But she has resigned due to internal political pressures. And then the other resignations that we have on the table is Sri Lanka, which we'll get to later because that's quite tough not to crack. I'm still very conflicted on the takes that happened there. There's still a lot to parse through with that, and the story isn't entirely finished. And the attempted resignation of Ser- of Mario Draghi that was rejected by Italian President Sergio Mattarelli. So we have covered the Johnson resignations in quite a bit of detail. There's still really no word on who his successor is going to be, no real uh, definitive word, that is. So that should be coming out in the next few weeks. It usually takes a about a month or a little over a month for those things to get finalized. But getting into particularly the story about Italy, because as a result of the Dutch farmer protests, protests have been sparked all across the continent, including but not limited to Spain, Germany, Poland. Um, there's, quite a, there's quite a few. I, I think uh, even France was having protests, but... That also gets in the question of Macron in his lame duck term without a legislate without a legislature in his favor, which we'll get into. We'll just get into the general political situation in Europe. But just covering the story with Mattarelli and Draghi. So after these protests spread, of course, they hit Rome and they hit Rome hard. These are the kind of protests I was expecting at the beginning of 2020 in late 2019 before the certain cataclysmic event of 2020 hit the world, especially in Italy. And it's just waves upon waves of people in the street in Rome in particular. There's other places in Italy where there's these demonstrations, but it's just a general dissatisfaction. And the disputes between the Dutch farmers and their government, particularly regarding environmental policy and EU policy has seem to have lit a match under Europe, and it's probably the most activity we've seen since the Yellow Vest, if I had to put it that way, just all across the continent. And you'll recall, I like to bring this up a lot, the Yellow Vest did manage to secure the resignation of the Belgian Prime Minister back in early 2019, late 2018. But with this happening right now, the polls, which election polls are coming out of Italy constantly because just the general instability of their government, people are always predicting another election. At this point, for the time being, Mattarelli wanting to prevent another election being brought to the Italian public has refused Draghi's resignation. Now, with that, it is important to note that unlike most presidents in parliamentary systems, Draghi is not popularly elected. He's elected by the legislature as well in a college of both chambers of the legislature as well as other government officials that actually do elect the Italian president. So when it comes to uh, heads of state or heads of government, in Italy there is no popular elections for said things, and it is in the hands of the legislatures and representative bodies to do that. So... I mean, not that I am the biggest defender of electoral politics or democracy in general, so I'm not saying that as some sort of scathing condemnation, but it is worth noting that in so far as popular executive leadership is concerned, uh, it is not popularly elected in Italy. And the polls coming out consistently show the right-wing coalition, whether that's the Lega party under Salvini or whether that's the Forza party to a lesser extent under former Prime Minister Berlusconi and his political allies, or the upcoming um, FDI party under Maloney and her political allies, or any other various coalitions of right-wing parties. And the polling recently that was 
what appears to be a blue wave because just the way that the way the parties are colored, the blue coalition is the conservative coalition, which is the exact opposite of the United States. In fact, just as a touch of electoral lots in the United States, really the only country that does red for the conservative or right wing side and blue for the liberal or left wing side. But point being is looking at the electoral maps it, uh, when it comes to the Chamber of Deputies and the Senate, it appears to be a impending blue wave whenever elections will be called next. And I do believe because of that, Moderelli, who is currently a political independent, but in previous years, up until the late 2000s, was affiliated with a number of left-wing parties, including the Democratic Party and other left-wing coalition parties, has prevented this election. Now, he's very pro-EU. He's what you would expect from a very established European politician. So he is putting off this election to as much as a degree as possible. And then this is on top of just the general situation in Europe. Again, we mentioned the protests coming up in Spain. There's been no governmental crisis there. Uh, they've spread to Poland when it comes to that, and Poland has the relatively conservative, relatively anti-European Union government in power, mind you. And there's already word out of Germany that they have begun energy rationing and that they are tapping into their reserves. And... German energy giants are warning of insolvency within days as of July 15th, which was this past Friday. Now, it is zero hedge, so I do take it with a grain of salt. I do have my opinions on zero hedge that I will spare you for now. But point being is, I don't think you need to doubt them too much in this situation when virtually everyone else is saying the same thing, that Germany is in a dire energy crisis and that major energy companies are going to be on the rocks and that they simply cannot provide a lot of the power. There's also word of rationing provisions being put out of Germany, whether that be for water, whether that be for, again, just about any basic utility. So the situation on the continent is getting painful. And once again, I am right about my predictions, not to talk myself up too much, but wrong about the timelines. I figured this stuff would be coming at the end of this year, or into next year, 2023, but it seems like some of my more dire predictions for the state of Europe in particular are coming to fruition now. The next few weeks we'll be telling, of course, we're about to reach the height of summer, late July, early August, when it gets the hottest, and I know air conditioning isn't as common in Europe as it is in the States, not to say it doesn't exist, but, I mean, air conditioning, uh, climate control, that takes a lot of energy let alone the upcoming winter, and I think I saw some headline talking about how this is supposed to be a particularly cold winter as compared to past years, if the projections are correct, so it looks to be a double whammy in terms of a hot summer and a cold winter for Europe, especially Northern Europe, especially Germany, which is a giant, not to mention, on top of all this, remember that Germany being a, an industrial hub needs energy to run its industry. It's not just about heating and not just about cooling, not just about utilities. It's about actually quite literally running the economy as well. Right. And, you know, even be, before the in, invasion, you know, we were talking about how the long range plan for Europe by America was to de industrialize it. Uh, so, in other words, have a financialized economy, have as much diversity as America has, because if America has it, they have to have it too. And what you need to do is you need to destroy Germany in order to achieve that. And everyone, I think, remembers that in the lead up to the invasion at the end of 2021, there were all kinds of concerted efforts promises that Nord Stream 2 would not start. And eventually it didn't start. And we prognosticated uh, long before we were talking about an invasion, whether there would be one or not, or what the conditions would there be for there to be a Russian invasion. We were already prognosticating that um, if this, if, if they shut down Nord Stream 2, then there'll be a gradual decline in industrial strength of Europe vis-a-vis -vis Germany. 
And th that is the long range plan. And that was basically America uh, having a tighter grip uh, over Europe through, a uh, through economic means, through a financialized economy. Um, and it would get to it would get what it wanted more out of Europe. Uh, Europe would suffer, but it would be uh, under firmer American control. Yeah, and, once you know, again, just to bolster your point here, the goal of America controlling Europe isn't to extract anything out of that because America can go elsewhere to extract whatever it needs out of Europe or produce it or uh, pull it out of the ground internally, whether that be a manufactured good or a resource. It's rather depriving Europe of a partnership with Russia and, mm -hmm. to a lesser extent, China, so that's one thing to also keep in mind when it comes to looking at American strategy in Europe. It's more so taking it away from others rather than using it for ourselves. Right, right. Um, so we prognosticated that, you know, th this would be a gradual thing, but really what has happened with the invasion. And that was one of the things we talked about pretty extensively in, in January and early February was that if uh, there was going to be an invasion, Nord Stream 2 would be sh shut down. There would be no question about that. And that did happen. So um, the Americans were, uh, I think, have wanted to shut down Nord Stream 2 far, far uh, longer ago than uh, anyone had uh, previously guessed. Um, or, well, of course they wanted it, but how serious were they about it? Uh, how much um, unanimity was there um, could have been speculated, but now we know for sure uh, that, that uh, the voices that wanted it shut down are willing to go uh, under any lengths to make sure that it's shut down. So, uh, and now we're finding out like how much of Europe's wealth and welfare state and all those other good things uh, are dependent on cheap, reliable gas from Russia. Um, uh, yes, America now is the largest oil supplier to Europe, but you notice that it has not diminished prices. And that was another thing that we said uh, would be that prices would be 30 to 40% more expensive. Again, America doesn't care what it will, um, it will do to Europe. And you have to wonder about like, you know, what is the, the what is America's long range plan for, for, for Europe? It's reaping some benefits, you know, but it's also creating, as you pointed out with all the protests and uh, heads of state resigning um, that, you know, th this is going to pr pr uh, create a kind of discontent. And, you know, if this war, in Ukraine ends badly. I think faith in America for many of these countries uh, will absolutely break. And uh, you're going to see different factions. You're going to see Poland and the Baltic states and a few other Eastern European states try to form something because they obviously feel like America cannot and will not back them. Uh, Western European states will, um, I would predict, will try to form some other kind of cooperation uh, in order to get themselves out of this mess. It will take a long time to achieve any of those things. And, you know, the worst has not yet come. And it will, uh, but we're not there yet. And, you know, off, you know, when prior to the recording, we were discussing how we're in a kind of a twilight period right now where many already know that this is a disaster, that the sanction packages against Russia have been a failure, that um, a, a cohesive union against Russia globally is not there. It's, in fact, it's, it's not just not there. There is active participation in um, supporting Russia economically. And um, that is also determining how Russia fights this war. So there, um, in many ways, the West has never looked so weak. Yes, and this is on top of all rhetoric to the contrary, that they're very much trying to drive this point home, that 
the West has never been stronger. And on top of leader resignations, I will say just as a note to our audiences that live in a more presidential system, particularly our American audience, as I'm sure those of you watching the show know, but if those if there's some of you who are less well versed in these parliamentary systems, a resignation, while it isn't a no big deal, is nothing compared to what a resignation is in the presidential system, especially in the American presidential system. Which brings up the question of Biden, who is I'll get into his antics in the Middle East later in the show, but who's Prospects for the midterms, the Democratic Party's prospects for the midterms are not looking good at all. I mean, there's just the factor of the seats in the Senate that are up for election just inherently favor the Republicans this cycle. Again, there'll be some cycles just depending on... It's always one-third of the state that's up every two years. So some cycles, it's states that lean blue. Some cycles, it's states that lean red. So it's states that lean red on top of an unpopular Democratic Party that is awash with economic issues and has a president with no charisma. There's been cases of candidates who are dodging Biden rallies whenever Biden comes to their districts or their state and are, are don't want to be there, don't want to be the opening speaker, don't want to be at some photo op with Biden. So it, it is somewhat reminiscent of the 2008 midterm elections with the, the Democrats and Obama, where a lot of Democrats wanted to distance themselves with Obama, who was, mind you, nowhere near as unpopular as Biden is right now, if official polling is to be believed. Mm -hmm. And I think, if anything, the official polling is being a bit generous uh, and probably bumping up what Biden's approval rating actually is in reality. But there's also the question of, will he make it to the end of the year? I do have some speculation on this. In order to save face, I think they will do everything they can to keep Biden in office for a full term. Now, if they run somebody against him in the 2024 primaries, or he announces I'm not running for re-election or whatever, that's one thing. But I do think, and this is a bit of a long shot, but I think it's within the realm of possibility, they engineer some reason for Biden to go, with, whether that be due to uh, health or physical condition or just some way he can't reasonably continue to serve in the office. I, I know there was speculation out of a leaked call from Canada that Trudeau apparently had received word that Biden would be stepping down after the 2022 midterms in the United States, so that is also something to keep in mind. And while I'm not saying it's a certainty or even likely, I do think there is a non-absurd possibility where it's reasonably possible that Biden throws in his hat and we get a caretaker government of Kamala Harris for a year and a half, two years, before they decide to either run her again or drudge up some other Democrat. Even though I do think when it comes to the deep state, the administrative state, whatever you want to call it, as we've elaborated previously on the show, they are willing to allow a Trump 2.0, so to speak, as we've described, a Trump that will be much more amenable to their goals. So that could be the game right now. I don't want to speculate too much this early on because there's only so much we can know. And being this early, we only have so much information to work with on that. But a lot of this may sound like some long shot stuff, but I don't want to come off as too crazy and I'm saying this purely as speculation, not as prediction. Yeah, uh, you know, I'm glad you brought up, uh, you know, future Trump. Um, I, I, I've changed my mind a little bit. I, I mean, I, I do think that if he runs, he has to be a far more compromised Trump than he was even during his presidency. Um, I mean, if you... You know, if you look at his backers and you look at what he actually achieved, uh, obviously he was there to create a kind of release valve for just how discontent a huge portion of the American public was, uh, where with where the country was heading, the prospect of Hillary becoming uh, president, and just dissatisfaction with Obama, particularly in his second term rather than his first term. Um, 
And, you know, so he, he canceled the JPCOA, which was his biggest project that he had to accomplish. And then, um, you know, he moved the American embassy from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem. Uh, he recognized um, the Golan Heights, as he did that um, uh, Israel is a Jewish state, and so on and so on and so on. So he got all those things done, and none of the campaign promises, except you know, de debatably with the with the judges, and but for the most yeah, part, yeah, and a couple of years of relative economic success. But other, yeah. other than that, the real core of the Trump thing, a lot of the uh, the national identity and cultural issues, while yeah, there was some headway, they were largely brushed aside. Right, right. And then the complete inefficacy of his presidency during the Floyd BLM riots. I mean, that that really that really was a mask off moment. And you really saw who who the sovereign of the state was. And it wasn't Trump. The sovereign is the deep state. And the deep state has, you know, one of their own. Um, I'm willing to bet, though, that um, if they see that there is no Democratic candidate that can replace Biden for 2024, that they would probably choose DeSantis over Trump if they could get DeSantis. I, I think, I, I, like I said, Trump accomplished a lot and he used the very kind of rhetoric that was necessary to get the votes that were needed for him to win. However, I think his rhetoric absolutely set up a panic uh, in American elites and Western elites in general. Trump is and, just as much of a drain on American political capital at home and abroad as I would say Biden. Now, it takes uh, very different forms, but I would say the damage is about comparable. Yeah, it's, it's comparable. And uh, DeSantis is, I think, preferable in, in many ways because uh, he's not as bombastic as Trump, but um, he's good for Israel. So that base is covered. It's literally America's most important base. <laughs> um, you know, he was he was uh, he he's considered quote unquote based um, by by some by some of the grifters, and um, I I think that is who they really want in in lieu of a Democrat nominee that uh, could be a comparable replacement for Biden. And Kamala Harris is not it. Kamala Harris is as unpopular as Biden is. Kamala is even more unpopular. Uh, they, they would get wrecked if she was running for president in 2024. It would, it would be one of the worst defeats that the party has ever had. Now, we all know that you know, the Democrat Party is the inner party and the Republican Party is the outer party. And in the center, that's where the that's where the sovereignty really lies. But the sovereignty likes to have a Democrat representative as much as possible. Uh, if they can't, then it'll be a, a compliant Republican. And if it's necessary that he acts like he's based and he you know, don't worry, uh, the Republicans will still lose the culture war. They're, they will still adapt to the direction of the culture war. That will still continue to go on. It, we've seen it many times in other presidencies where, you know, that war has slowed down, then it its tempo starts to rise again. It, it But it's still, it's always ongoing. And... Um, I mean, I don't, I don't want to overlook the significance of Roe v. Wade. Um, I, I think what's particularly interesting about that is it's to set up a, it's enhanced the kind of segregation that is voluntarily happening across America, where you have people leaving blue states for red states. And just to clarify for our good friends over at YouTube, we mean political segregation, not any other kind. <laughs> okay, let's <laughs> let's just yeah. cover all our bases here before somebody goes. Eh. Yeah. Yeah. So um, what's interesting, I think, about this ruling is, is um, 
first of all, it did not energize the Democrat Party. Uh, so far, it hasn't worked. It, it, it hasn't produced nearly the kind of protest that everybody thought. Now, I don't know. You know, maybe we're going to see it energized as we get closer to November, but uh, I don't see it yet. Now, it was pointed out to and, me on a source that would prefer not to be named on the show, but somebody I was talking to about this, that, in fact, it actually has become a demoralizing issue where they feel spurned by the party for not doing anything. And I recall a certain interview afterwards where they're asking Kamala Harris, well, when you had a majority in both legislatures as well as the uh, presidency, why didn't you put forward some sort of federal law for abortion access or um, X, Y, or Z issue? And Kamala just gave some non-answer, just like, again, it was a completely non-sequitur, completely unrelated to anything that was brought up previously. And... Uh, from what I've noticed, at least, uh, and from some of the polling, it seems to actually have demoralized them that they don't trust the elements within their party to actually execute those goals, which in turn could drive down turnout. Right. It gets at the heart of the messianic quality of liberalism, particularly American liberalism, right? Now, you could tell them, well, you know, in your state, um, abortion is legal up until the you know the the hour of birth it's like you don't like it you can stay there but that doesn't satisfy the messianic need right it's like talking to like shit libs in real life who uh they're afraid of russia winning in ukraine because that could mean they they'll end up living under an authoritarian government here now they, what they don't realize is a lot of dissidents in the West already feel like they're living under an authoritarian government. And it's very hard to get through to these people. Like, your values are so aligned with the elites of this nation that when they do draconian measures on tapping down on free speech, for instance, you don't feel that because you think that's the right thing to do, right? So... Anyways, it's nearly impossible to get through to them on this. And if you do, of course, if you do say, well, you know, it's it's a it's a question of preference, they get mad. Now, but why is it that they get mad, right? The reason they get mad is it is unacceptable to say it's a question of preference because they're arguing for a universal truth. And if a truth is universal, and in this case, we're talking about abortion, but it could be all kinds of liberal causes. Uh, if that's true, then you have a messianic mission. You cannot let liberalism just stay within small pockets around the globe. It must spread. It's a universal truth. In and of itself, it, it innately asks you to spread its, its message, right? And that's what makes them so angry. As soon as, it, for them, that you're playing the relativity game, right? Like, like, you know, I remember when I came back from Russia and I was talking to a liberal friend of mine and I said, if you went there, you wouldn't like it. I go, but I liked it. I felt more free there than here. For you, that won't be the case. Just as for me, it's not the, it, 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 I don't feel as free here. Do you understand? It's just like, but of course that's unacceptable, right? You must have their values. You must have their world point of view. And um, I think that Roe v. Wade sets up this kind of relativity in, in, uh, in liberalism. We've already talked about uh, people moving to states where the states reflect more of, let's say, their values or the laws in, in that state or uh, laws that they're more in support of. Um, that is untenable for them. Like liberalism is a cause. It is a state religion. It has to, it has to be spread. Everyone must come underneath it. And that's why these liberals, uh, as you say, are so demoralized is, um, in a way, let's say if you made, um, if you, if, if abortion in America was made illegal in every state, I know there's no apparatus for that. I get it. But let's say that was the case, right? 
their reaction would have been totally different. But because th this localizes the argument, right? In in that, well, you know, you're in California, you got, you're in New York, you're in Michigan, uh, uh, you're in Illinois. What do you have to worry about? You're in um, the state of Washington. Who cares? It also like, has given have... the uh, the Democratic establishment a feeling of overlordship. For example, you saw Biden talking about using federal grounds in order to establish uh, abortion yeah, yeah. clinics, whatnot, yeah. or offshore ones where, yeah. again, it can be like, well, us saying Blue Islands can dominate this Red Sea. Right, 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 right. So for them, it's a failure. It's a failure of the messianic mission of liberalism. That is what's got them so demoralized. It's not enough to, dis, uh, to energize them into re reversing this hypothetical ruling that I said uh, about making abortion completely illegal in the U.S. Um, but in a way, it's even it's it's even more effective because it, for one, of course, obviously it, it divides the states into red and blue. It, it's a polarizing effect, but it gives options. So it appeals to a kind of pragmatism. Um, and in doing so, it uh, it destroys the ability uh, to promulgate liberalism, and and this is what so uh, this this is what has hurt them the most, right? Um, because it's a half measure, it's actually more effective than if it was a full measure, if that makes sense, in in demoralizing them, and in. Um, it's kind of like uh, the war in Ukraine. That too is demoralizing them. They they see the the grand picture, and it does look like um, liberalism is dying out. And uh, I think they're very well aware of that. And these small incremental steps towards um, 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 demoralizing them is actually more effective than an all-out assault. Not that there was ever a plan for all, an all-out assault, but I'm saying from their point of view, yes, many of them, many of them are pretty schizo, and they do think like there's elaborate theories about Democrats are also Nazis, and uh, they're they're in cahoots with the Republic. Like they're they are just as insane or more insane than than the Q-tard guys. I mean, they are right for the wrong reasons. I I do believe in the Republicrat Nazi conspiracy theory in in a sense, okay? Let's just say that um yeah. uh, let's just let's just quote our, uh, our our good friend from Crimea here where where is he? <laughs> uh, yeah, that that guy right there. I think he's got it right, but uh, I think you all knew that was coming. <laughs> but um, <laughs> with that little aside out of the way, uh, we do have Quite a bit of other news to cover when it comes to this, so I will move on to some of the stories related to the Middle East right now, particularly Biden's visit to Israel mm. and Saudi Arabia. So, starting with his Israel visit, because that's where he went first, uh, as was expected, he went to go meet with Prime Minister Yair Lapid, and he also met with former Prime Minister Naftali Bennett, because he still is a member of the Knesset and still a very prominent legislator, and... I do believe also is one of the candidates to become prime minister yet again in the upcoming election later in the year that with like Netanyahu, Lapid, again, typical parliamentary election stuff. So there were a few gaffes in Israel, which I will point out and make fun of, but there was also uh, quite a bit of substantial things said on both sides that I think is worth serious analysis. So first was... He was giving a speech about um, H cost remembrance, we'll call it for the sake of YouTube. And he said, instead of horror, he said to honor rather than to. Uh, mm. he, it was. Um, that was a, a minor gaffe. Then there was one where he had finished a press conference he was giving and he went to shake the hand of. Uh, the Israeli counterpart with him, except he turned the wrong way and started walking the wrong way. So just just the real typical. Uh, he, he tried to shake hands with the air. Yes, yeah. In, in, in which case, I, I don't know. He might be seeing uh, ancient Canaanite demons and uh, communing with them for all we know at that point. Uh, I mean, <laughs> but uh, in, in all seriousness, 
there was some substantial talks regarding the Iran issue. Lapid outright said that we can't rely on your current negotiating text with Iran regarding trying to revive the JCPOA and that you need to do something harder about the Iranian issue. So more so returning to the, the returning to form with Israel calling for outright action against the Iranians. There were Palestinians who hopelessly expected Biden to give them an ear when it came to some sort of peace proceedings. He met with a boss and he told the boss, now I don't believe a word of this, but he told mm-hmm. the boss that, oh, we're going to try to uh, return things to the 1967 stabs quo that pretty much every yeah. year. That pretty much every U.S. president, including Trump, says, like, even the most, like, fervently Zionistic ones are like, uh, well, yeah, 1967 an international agreement, blah, 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 uh, it just really common stuff, which means likely nothing is going to happen on that front. And with all of that, again, he met with um, various figures, and in fact, he had actually met with... Uh, some of the Christian bishops in Jerusalem who did express concern over the Jewish nation state law that has been in the works in Israel for the past few years, fearing that it would push them further, especially as Israeli expansion expansion continues into the West Bank. And I think the trip really encapsulated where things are right now in terms of Israel being on the ropes, Joe Biden being in office in the first place, and it reeked of desperation. Now, if you want to get a bit more metapolitical or even, again, take a religious point of view on this, it it has been pointed out that if you want to look at the historical kingdoms uh, of, of Israel, according to biblical record, that seldom did they last more than 75 to 80 years, and Israel is currently 77 years old. So there could be concern, whether unfounded or not, that Israel might be on its last legs as a uh, Jewish polity in that land, which I've maintained for the past couple years now, as I'm sure you said, that Israel has been on the ropes. Israel is in the weakest position it has been since its founding, since 1967, if you want to really uh, stretch it like that, and that the possibility of Israel either being cut down to size or completely abolished, in my lifetime at least, isn't an unreasonable prediction. And again, I, I won't speak for your lifetime, but again, the the idea that like, Israel, absent a strong and proactive American empire, which, I mean, that will be the last ask that the American empire defends. You, know, I, I'm, you can revisit the Pelosi yeah. quote. Even if, this, uh, even if this building were in rubble, one thing would be for sure we would stand with yeah. Israel, <laughs> yeah, w- w- which which is funny because the first uh, congressional session after J six was passing an aid bill to Israel, so um, <laughs> I I suppose really living up to the promise there, Nancy. But with that being said, Israel is at the weakest it has been since its founding, in my opinion, and Israel is on the ropes. Just to reiterate, and without a strong American empire. The warm and fuzzy feelings that have started to develop in the Arab world, whether that be in the Gulf states, and even again, even warm and fuzzy is a bit facetious on my part, but the tentative peace that's been developed between, say, Jordan and Egypt and the Gulf states, and with more of the Gulf states recognizing it, we'll get into some of the news about Saudi Arabia and Biden's meetings with um, Mohammed bin Salman there, is that once... American influence it starts to retract from the region, and as it continues to intra- contract for the retract from the region, I should say, uh, and as Russia and China move in, both of them, while they don't have bad relationships with Israel, they have been rocky in the past few years. In fact, Russia and Israel have had a great back and forth. Russia did pass that new law regarding, of course. Uh, certain Jewish agencies and uh, Israeli lobbies in the country, so uh, that 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 has caused a bit of dispute between the countries, which I can only imagine will escalate, not to mention Russia, passing its constitutional referendum regarding the clause of dual citizens and people who have held foreign residency 
with all those factors combined, not that Russia or China are dedicatedly anti-Zionist, but they're not going to cooperate with Israeli interests, and again, will even actively oppose them, as we've seen in some cases, if need be. And with that being said, I don't think at this point or any point in the near future we're going to see some Arab coalition defeat Israel like they tried to do many times before, but Israel may get to the point once again where it is slowly surrounded on all sides, where it is completely encircled, and with a Washington that is not inactive, that hasn't abandoned it, but is much more willing to stand by on set issues, which at that point, it's either go all out and wage an even more aggressive foreign policy from Israel's perspective than before, than what they're doing now, or buckle and try to come to actual amicable terms that aren't dictated by the U.S. to the Arab states with its neighbors. In which case, I think both are a long ways off, but I think one is much more likely than the other. Yeah, I mean, just recently, um, you know, to add to the many good points you've you've brought up with Israel, on a material um, level, uh, it's, there's a rumor that uh, Hamas or one of the other uh, Palestinian groups has smuggled anti-missile uh, defense systems. And I remember last year I said that they would do that, that they would eventually do that. Um, I think they, they, they sense the weakness uh, and, and that ultimately Israel's strength is based on America's strength. And no one... No one in in Palestine, no one in Israel is fooled by America's um, neutrality. There's no neutrality. America, um, to to think so is ridiculous. Um, So I think they're aware of it, uh, the the Palestinians, that is. And just, you know, in the past, you know, Russia began to support and work closely with the Arab states from the late 60s onwards, and then later with Egypt in, I believe, 73, uh, they supported the PLO. Um, uh, So did China. Uh, So these, you know, these these alliances can quickly shift back after a few decades, right? Um, And they can bring pressure on on Israel and, and by extension, America that way. The other, uh, you know, you, we, we brought up Biden's visit to both Israel and Saudi Arabia. And the interesting thing is 24 hours before he lands, Saudi Arabia uh, states that they are looking to join BRICS and they will be having talks in either January or February of 2023. And that's on to top get- of Egypt as well. That's right, Egypt and Turkey. Um, okay, I mean, uh, a week ago it was Argentina and Iran, and now it's building. Uh, this is what I meant about that there is no global unified effort uh, against Russia. It is crumbling. Uh, Russia, in many ways, um, prosecuted this war in a way that wasn't too heavy-handed at, uh, at the beginning. It's accelerating now. Um, this helped establish diplomatic uh, victories when America was frantically going around in March and April to try to get everybody on board to sanction Russia, to not buy oil and gas, and so on and so on. And meanwhile, Russia's exports have uh, gone through the roof. In Europe, the profits have gone through the roof while selling less. So, you know, th- this has been a real windfall for them. Um, I would say that um, it's, this, it's these kinds of developments that are probably raising the morale of, of, of Palestinians to continue to, to fight against uh, Israel. Um, and it's also, you know, Biden made an interesting statement. He said that um, um, he wouldn't abandon the Middle East and he would make 
uh, renewed efforts, which in a sense kind of is letting the cat out of the bag that, you know, we have to be careful with these things because frankly, in two weeks, uh, the narrative could change all over again. But if you take a look at this statement on face value, what he's basically saying is, is uh, don't worry about uh, Taiwan and Ukraine. Uh, we're, we're, this place is always going to be the, the, the number one priority. I suppose he has to say that um, to the Israelis. Um, in other news uh, from this region, there were some islands that uh, the Israelis had taken from the Saudis. They've been returned to the Saudis, but there's a deal that the Israelis can park their jets there. Uh, they're very, very tiny islands in the Red Sea, but they're very um, strategic. So that's an interesting development. But if you look at BRICS um, and you look at the Red Sea, what you have now potentially are the two countries with like the largest real estate of banks on the Red Sea that, uh, th that are going to be joining BRICS. This is a very pivotal point in um, you know, geopolitics and, and global economics, frankly, right? Um, so there's, you know, I, 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 I honestly cannot believe how quickly things are accelerating. Yeah, and getting in, I'll get in some of the news about Saudi Arabia in a minute, but it is accelerating at rates, again, we haven't seen for probably half a century at this point. I, I know I was saying that Israel is in the weakest position it's ever been, in which I do agree with that, but we are reaching a very 1973-like situation when it comes to the Middle East in general. Now, I doubt the Saudis are about to cut off oil production over support of Israel. In fact, they seem to be going in the exact opposite direction. But just all the tensions where when it comes to energy, when it comes to a lot of things in the Middle East being on the fritz, it does harken back to some of these previous conflicts and to lose the sense that, uh, again, we could end up with the trifecta I was talking about a few weeks back where it's Russia versus Ukraine, China makes a move on Taiwan, and Iran does something that sparks a greater, or Iran responds to something that sparks a greater conflict in the Middle East, but the point being is uh, pro-Iranian forces versus anti-Iranian forces uh, escalating the conflict in the entire region. So, with that being said, Biden has gone to Saudi Arabia, in which case he both changed his tune and did not change his tune because, you'll recall yeah. on the campaign trail, one of the things he hammered on about is he was going to hold Saudi Arabia accountable for its human rights records. He was asked if he was going to bring up, uh. <laughs> bring up Khashoggi, of course, the liquidated CIA asset, uh, in his meeting with Mohammed bin Salman, the current crown prince of Saudi Arabia and who is more or less effectively running the country in the stead of King Salman, who was an aged man, mid eighties thereabout. So I suppose a man after Biden's own heart in that sense, at least, but <laughs> that was brought up. The issue of oil was brought up and the issue of opening airspace to Israel was also brought up. And with those issues being brought up, the issue of opening airspace to Israel is probably the, least contested or controversial out of the three. Khashoggi, Biden claims to have brought it up after saying he wasn't going to bring it up. They say he stopped short of bringing it up, so I doubt anything really came of that unless Biden sort of spotted it out and it didn't really you know, turn into a conversation topic with, with the Saudis. And one of the other ones is touching yet again on what Saudi Arabia has been saying for the past several months since the beginning of this energy crisis is that we're already drilling at a great capacity. We're not going to drill anymore. We'd be pushing our limits if that were the case, which I somewhat believe them. I do believe that they're, of course, they're downplaying it and they're benefiting from yeah. the energy market doing what it's doing right now. I don't know how it's affected their budget crunch from about seven or eight years ago, but I can only imagine that it is doing wonderful things to fix that budget crunch with these high energy prices. And, oh, yes. <laughs> uh, so they're unwilling to budge on the issue of energy. Now, keep in mind, back in April 2020, so two and a quarter years ago, 
Oil was in the negatives. Russia and Saudi Arabia were in what seemed like a price war to, uh, or Russian OPEC as a whole seemed to be in a price war to drive the prices to the bottom of the market and then some into the basement of the market. But now we are sitting with oil as it is right now. The Gulf states are loving it. Uh, it's proved to have been, in a way, ironically beneficial for Russia when it was supposed to be in action meant to punish them and try to bring them to the negotiating table and try to get them to make concessions when anything but has actually happened. And there was an interesting note related to Russian energy in particular, is that if Russia decided to completely cut off Western markets, that oil would go up about three times what it is to around $380 a barrel. Uh, and again, that, if they were to do that before the American midterms, that would be... Uh, for the American energy market, a huge spike in gas prices, especially in which everything else would follow then. It would be even worse for Europe, considering the fact that there is a high level of dependency of outside energy sources, most of which come from Russia, if Russia were to cut them out and cut off Western markets completely. Instead of this just waffling back and forth game that we've seen right now, I mean, Nord Stream 2 has only been shut down for five days. Nord Stream 1, excuse me, has only been shut down for about five days, and we're already seeing the panic set in in Germany. And with that, there were no obvious gaffes like a massive misspeak about the age cost or trying to shake the hands of an entity that either we could not see or was not there in Saudi Arabia. But nonetheless, it was a gridlock, except for the issue of securing uh, Israeli air travel and uh, airspace access in Saudi Arabia. So, it was successful for, I suppose, everything that was required, but in terms of fighting back in this energy war, it was anything but. Yes. Uh, some other some other little tidbits I learned about this uh, this visit by Biden is um, on the face of it, you know, he seems to have gotten, a, 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 you know, a, a fairly amicable reception. But if you look at photos of when Putin visited uh, Saudi Arabia last, uh, you notice that the chairs are side by side. They're talking in close proximity. They're not divided. It's simply. Um, Ben Salman, uh, ben Salman and Putin uh, alone in the room. Uh, Biden as Salman are there with their small entourage and they're separated quite a bit. Um, other leaders have been g given an, like, you know, entire hotels for them to stay in. Uh, Putin was given actually one of the royal palaces and uh, when he arrived, <laughs> he was given an entourage with 16 um horsemen uh, riding along with his limousine <laughs> cavalcade. It was uh, j just outrageous. So th these are all these little signs that um, that leaders are constantly signaling with uh, one another and people who are very astute and who remember these things, particularly journalists, will know what to read into them, right? And Salman only has said that they can only increase uh, production of oil capacity by maybe around a million barrels extra a day, but they can't do more than that. And he warned against any price cap on, on oil. In other words, I think um, they see this time as, as an opportunity to change the pieces on the chessboard. And... Um, to restructure the game uh, after many decades more in their favor. Salman was all also very adamant about not, uh, you know, looking to work more closely with Iran and not engaging in, in you know, in any kind of conflict with, uh, with his neighbors. Um, so there's a kind of pragmatism that's setting in there. Um, and I, I, you know, it should also be because you recall that, Salman when he first that, came that, on the scene, like, he was one of the most fervent proponents of the Yemen war, and he, he's really changed right, his right. tune in light of reality. Right, and because he can do more for his country, right? Like there's less this the 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 fear that Iran is going to control 
uh, the entire Middle East is, is uh, it's so overblown. Um, the, the fact of the matter is they can accomplish more with one another if they cooperate. And this is an opportune time to do it. But I think also another thing I wanted to say from like a theopolitical point of view is that while America has entrenched itself in its own theopolitics of like homo liberalism, um, you see that um, the creeping in of pragmatism and even traditionalism is starting to overtake the region. Now, of course, Iran has been, was the original trailblazer. It was the original uh, conservative revolution that, 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 that took place in that region. And even further abroad, if you uh, want to look at it that way. Um, now, I bring this up because while Israel is becoming more nationalistic, you know, than it has been, uh, like moving the capital to Jerusalem uh, by being um, less cooperative and so on, and, you know, stating that Israel is a Jewish state. Uh, alienating all the other groups that, that have been there for thousands of years. Um, it's difficult for America to, on the one hand, ex uh, uh, expect out of Saudi Arabia a, a liberal reformation to take place there, while that the opposite is occurring in Israel, right? And this is one of those, this is what I mean about there's a pivot happening right now that they can take advantage of, uh, where they don't have to adopt policies because of pressure from the U.S. Uh, that are going to alienate themselves from their own um, um, constituents, their own um, populations, right? So there's less political sacrifice, there's more money coming in, and America has, uh, cannot dictate to them how they ought to act and be. In fact, like after they brought up Khashoggi, 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 they said, well, what are you doing about the Christian Palestinian journalist that was killed just a few weeks ago? And that the Israelis, you know, tried to disrupt, like they tried to knock down the, 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 the you know, the pallbearers who were holding up uh, her coffin for, for, for goodness sake. So um, they gave it back to him. Uh, this kind of lecturing that we saw in uh, late 2019, or, uh, early 2020, remember when Blinken went to Alaska? Um, and the, had the uh, rainbow just, hair aids? Yeah. Like, no, that just, has double nobody meaning. Nobody is putting up Pardon with this. Me. Like, this is, this is, this, this is uh, an ideology just strictly for the areas that America already controls. It's a form of consolidation. It's a, it's a social shibboleth. You have to say that you agree with it or you're an outcast. It's a friend-enemy distinction just when it gets brought up. And, and that's all it is, right? It's a, it's a placeholder for some other kind of um, uh, testimony of faith. And uh, it's, not, it's not working. And I, I think, really, the last 30 years, uh, in many ways, America kind of blew its own potential to be, you know, a, a real world leader. It, it already, it already annihilated that because it wanted to be hegemon first. Yes, that does seem to have been the case. And this is something I believe we also hammered on at great length over the past several years that in pursuit of a policy of world domination, we have let so many pragmatic goals go to the wayside. And I do think it brings up an interesting debate between Kissinger and what he represents and Brzezinski, what he recommend, uh, represents. Really the two titans of American foreign policy and geostrategy. And while they never clashed, their ideas have been clashing since the 1970s and proponents of their ideas have been butting heads since the 1970s, where... Kissinger was the, the realist, the pragmatist, in the raw sense, of course, making the guarantees to the Soviet Union that if China is to present too much of a threat, we'll have your back, making the exact same promise to China. If the Soviet Union presents too much of a threat, we'll have your back. Uh, Nixon defusing the 1969 border war there, just for an example. And really looking at the resources you have, 
deciding when to use force when appropriate, and really managing an empire with the resource it has and not trying to conquer the world with it. Now, as somebody with more non-interventions and, dare I say, even isolationist tendencies, I still don't agree with a lot of what Kissinger says or really what anyone Mm. in mainstream foreign policy says, but it's a much more pragmatic outview if America is going to be an empire, how it has to behave itself. Whereas Brzezinski's idea of the grand chessboard, where it has to constantly be about encircling enemies and making sure they're crushed and dedicating all your resources to that. While he is one of the more competent actors with that, certainly his acolytes and successors have not carried over his, at least sense of the situation where they've turned the, arming of the Mujahideen into a very much copy-paste process. And not to defend that action either, but it is something that they decide they can use in Syria. It's something they decide they can use in Iraq or Afghanistan, or Afghanistan again. And again, it's become this copy-paste model. The idea that we need to be constantly fomenting all these former Soviet statelets or these other small countries into an aggressive position against Russia in order to squeeze them out. Uh, the very weird back and forth China, where you need to keep China in good grace in order to squeeze out Russia, but also make sure China doesn't grow too far out of control, and uh, controlling that Central Asian pivot zone, which is why he was so obsessed with like, Afghanistan in particular. So just to compare the two strings of thought of American foreign policy for the past uh, 50 or so years, ironically enough, they both were very critical of rabid Zionism. Now, when push came to shove, they would guarantee Israel its existence. They would say they would stand with Israel. But they weren't, for example, the neoconservatives of the 90s and onwards, where it was very hardcore Zionistic that we will serve Israel's interests, that we will make sure they get what they want. So that is one strange point of concurrence when it comes to uh, the two great minds of the American Empire strategy that you can't stake everything on this little state in the Middle East. Which is funny because it seems like that policy is being adopted more and more. However, they will, as I've said before, not necessarily give everything Israel everything it wants, but as long as they're capable, they will give Israel everything it needs. But point being is, as you had brought up, which sent me on this entire rant altogether, America <laughs> has realized, and Okay, maybe it arguably hasn't realized. Elements within America have somewhat realized, just to put all the qualifiers in that statement, that they have overplayed their hand with this empire, and that pragmatism is really the only way to preserve it, but they've dug themselves in so deep right. that pragmatism is going to look like, and in many ways will be, a retreat from many theaters and a abandoning of many projects that have had decades of time and billions, if not trillions of dollars, sunk into them. Yeah, I mean, it's you, you say it very well. Um, it, you know, I've often thought, like, maybe that is what's happening, that underneath the surface, um, like, uh, the, the bombastic uh, language about values, values, law and order, like, uh, I mean, everything the last 30 years contradicts anything that you hear about them, the, the uh, you know, rules and law-based order, like, it's nonsense, um, uh, but they, you know, they, they fervently repeat it. However, uh, the success on the field isn't there. The dominance isn't there. Uh, if if you look at the broad picture, there is a, a, a sort of retreat happening. Obviously, uh, the war in Ukraine has proven that Russia has incredible industrial capacities to fight wars and that it's foolish to even try to engage in a conventional war with Russia. Uh, Russia let go without like having to appeal to, um, like in a, diff- a war in a different context, okay, in a different political context, uh, would have the same backers. They would still be behind Russia, but they would not have to um, uh, tread so uh, carefully in the way they prosecute a war. So, you know, if you if, if you look at the, you know, the, the last 31 years, 
there's kind of like a retreat that I would say like the high point was probably just before uh, Obama or when Obama decided to do the counteroffensive in Afghanistan in 2011, 2012. Um, since then, it's, you know, it, it has started to go the other way. And uh, I don't think America has the ability to launch another great war like the kind that we saw in the early 2000s and in the early 90s. I, I think that's done. And uh, um, I don't think America is going to intervene in Ukraine. Uh, I could be wrong, but I, I, I don't think that's on the table. Um, there was something else that I... I wanted to uh, to say, but uh, it's escaped me now. But uh, anyhow, I'll leave it there. I mean, in the topic of intervention in Ukraine, direct intervention in Ukraine, or the U.S. waging any sort of mass-scale war that has since, say, the early 2000s with the second Iraq war, the American public is even more divided and deracinated than it was in 2003. Yeah. And Iraq was already a hotly debated issue in both the government and among the populace. The idea that they would be able to do this, a war that would in all likelihood require some level of conscription. I mean, you look, at, you go back to some of these Middle Eastern wars and go back to one of the many generals that they would rotate out every six months out of Afghanistan. Can't remember the name of the one, but it escapes me, but pretty much the only one to say it frankly, that in order to accomplish what you want us to, and this is at the height of both Iraq and Afghanistan, we're going to need some sort of draft or some sort of conscription. We are going to need uh, a lot more numbers uh, for the mission that you are giving us than uh, than we already have. And that's simply, I don't think, something the American public is willing to do. I mean, there always is the possibility of some shenanigans where another American boat suddenly sinks under serious circumstances, as happened so many times before whenever America needs to get into war. But... Even with that, I mean, there were strikes on the embassy in Baghdad for several years that didn't energize the American population. I mean, in many ways, both good and bad, the American populace has become disconnected from these wars, so they don't have really the fervor to want to put a stop to these, but it's also so disconnected that they don't feel like they need to contribute anything because a professional, highly trained, uh, careerist military establishment is taking care of it, and it doesn't require me to go do it or me to make any even material sacrifices for these war efforts, say, as you may have had to during either the World Wars or even, uh, for example, a career in Vietnam. Not that those were particularly industrial taxing wars, but, I mean, there were some, and especially with Vietnam with the draft crisis, as I'm sure you all know, but when it comes to American uh, military capability, enlistment numbers are already down, less people are joining, less people are eligible to join, whether it be because of physical con conditions, education requirements, criminal record, uh, even mental health requirements, especially nowadays. So, we discussed <laughs> a few weeks ago, I think it was like a month and a half ago, that the U.S. Army in particular was lowering its recruitment standards where they got rid of the requirement for a high school diploma or equivalent. So that eliminates that, which I will say just from a completely pragmatic sense in a vacuum, I don't really have that much of a problem with. But point being is the fact that they're willing to do something like that <laughs> just shows the level of desperation. I wouldn't be surprised if they loosened some of the criminal record requirements if it really came down to it. But point being is, in order to meet these numbers, you have to do this. You have the military more and more becoming a social experiment. I mean, mass militaries in the modern era have always been a social experiment. I mean, they've had to just function. But in terms of, again, them being non-immune to really the uh, corporate diversity culture that seemed to infect every other facet, you know, state ideology... That seemed to infect every other facet of American life and every other American institution. They haven't been immune from that. And once again, something else to consider is the American military, especially post-1991, isn't geared to fight a conventional war, but rather be a foreign police force for our colonies in Europe and Asia in particular. And 
if it really comes down to the wire, be a domestic police force in the case that there were to be any great internal disorder. Right, and in many ways they're preparing more for that than anything else. Um, you know, you see more stories about um, uh, American military staff that has not taken the vaccine, that it will be, you know, they will be denied any of their benefits, eh? so essentially they'll be kicked out. Uh, that's about 60,000 right now. That may not seem like a lot, but that's up, that's 10% of America's entire fighting force. That's not really that insignificant. And um, when you consider the recruitment is down 23%, this is, you know, this is not a joke, but like I say, um, the rhetoric is there to kind of conceal a retreat. And, um, it's very possible that the retreat uh, it is a, it's kind of like a gambit to play a waiting game. That is, America goes in retreat for about 10 years, and then it starts to rebuild itself, waiting for its opponents to make mistakes, so on and so on, right? Now, I think there's there are people in policy positions who think that that's probably a good idea and others that don't think it's a good idea. And of course, you could make the very reasonable argument that it isn't planned, that uh, the forecasts for America still being, let's say, beyond the financial question, um, you, know, uh, um, um, you know, the kind of military power that it, that, that it was, is not there. And the the division at home is uh, getting wider, and that that is actually a more pressing issue right now than uh, winning uh, in 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 Ukraine. Because of course, if they if they wanted to, they could have they could have devoted a lot more, right? They could have they could have. I said this last week and the week before. They could have used an entirely different strategy, right? They could have had a lot more heavy equipment already in Ukraine. Uh, Russia would not have invaded if uh, if there were more Abrams tanks and and Leopard One and Leopard Two tanks in 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 Ukraine, right? They could have set up more shops for repairing these types of tanks, right? Uh, all of that could have been done. Instead, they didn't because they went on a, a because there's so much hubris attached to America's uh, financial strength and economic strength and ability to like control the markets that and and you know play as an influencer by just you know of basically offering elites of various countries you know huge truckloads of money like for them to adopt american policy yeah another and, point on ukraine in terms of building it up is and we'll get into this in the ukraine segment but a lot of the issue is they don't have the infrastructure to support a lot of the military equipment they've received as aid, whether that be tanks or artillery pieces. They don't have the yeah. infrastructure to maintain or repair these things, which why you have just fields of wasted tanks. You get into the numbers where Poland's giving away something like half its tank fleet in Ukraine, most of which is just getting decimated by Russian strikes and missiles that are out of range of man pads, and it's become practically a target practice game for Russian forces. Right, and even some of the man pads have not been working very well at all. Some of them are very old. Um, some of them, um, the armor is too thick. It's so, I mean, you, yeah, you can knock out a BMP. I mean, you can knock out a T ninety too, but um, it's much harder to do that with a uh, with um, a T eighty or a T ninety or a T seventy two with uh, upgraded armor. I've seen videos of a uh, of a T seventy two get hit three times with one of those man pads and still keep going. So that in and of itself is not enough either. And you're right. So the, the industrial capacity is not there, but I'm just saying like they could have adopted, um, for instance, a strategy where they, where there was more heavier machinery where Russia would have uh, had a more difficult time uh, in the early months than they, than they did. Um, but I'm just saying there could have been other measures, but they were so confident that the world was going to be behind them, that they were going to be intimidated, that um, Russia's economy 
uh, was so one dimensional that it would it, it couldn't even wage such a war. Um, and, uh, and and yet here we are. Right. Um, well, let's not forget the ultimate act of hubris in this war, which actually started before Russia invaded, which was Ukraine's attempted offensive on the Donbass. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Right. Right. And, and, you know, this was something I think that they planned to do last year uh, um, in April 2021 uh, when um, when Biden called uh, Putin a killer. All, all of that was just re already pre-rehearsed stuff. Right. Uh, but it never took off. Somebody somebody in on the Ukrainian side got cold feet and decided not, not to do it. And then, you know, in February of this year, they either that person changed his mind or that person is no longer working for them. And with that being said, I suppose uh, I'll hand it over to you for your minutia minute. <laughs> OK, well, there's uh, there's lots of news, but there's no news from from Snake Island. Uh, nobody knows what's going on at Snake Island anymore. There's no inhabitants of Snake Island. I hear Romania has rightfully reclaimed it. <laughs> I, I, one could only hope. There, but... There's a Romanian flag now. So I'll begin with the south of the region. Now, um, actually, before I begin, I should say that since the last show, there have been several, several strikes by the Russians with their missiles. And it's traditionally what happens is this. So in the evening, Russia will send out its cruise missiles. And in the morning, Ukraine will respond with artillery fire in Tochkayuz and the, the HIMARS. And this will go back and forth. So this is the, the cycle that has developed over the last month and a half. Uh, even longer, but it's very routine now. Uh, that said, uh, some centers, uh, some command centers were taken out, like uh, a center in uh, Venezia, which is kind of central western Ukraine. It is uh, uh, directly north of Transcarpathia and um, uh, Moldova. Uh, this was a command center. Uh, now, unfortunately, there were some civilian casualties, but the general for Ukraine's um, air force was taken out in the attack. However, in the last 48 hours or so, there have been more attacks on garrisons, including again in Mykolaiv, but there have been others in Kharkov, and a smaller one, which also had like a command post for uh, some of the forces that are rushing in to contain the, the push from the Russians in Donbass. And that was in Konstantinovka. Uh, that, the Russians claimed 50, and then about a day later, it emerged that 47 had indeed died. Now, the Russians are saying that over a thousand um, men have been killed and, and these latest attacks on on garrisons. Uh, these also include foreign fighters. Uh, an American foreign fighter has uh, has died. Oh, no, a British. Yeah, I think he was a British foreign fighter. He's died from um, from some kind of an illness. Um, he claimed to be a, uh, some kind of a um, you know aid worker. Uh, but uh, there's this videos of him. He's not an aid worker. He's he volunteered to fight uh, on the uh, you know in Donbass. So um, now, if we look at the south, there's not much change there. There is an exchange of fire, but the probably the biggest news uh, from the south is the attack on a warehouse in the Kherson region. Uh, this killed seven civilians. The Ukrainians claim uh, that there was a um, th that the Russians were storing their military supplies in there, and that's uh, which is not likely because the Russians have been storing them, you know, in their trucks or inside Russia itself and delivering them. Those convoys that we've been seeing, those convoys have never stopped. Second of all, uh, most of the attacks that are happening from the Ukrainian side are on civilian targets. And they've never, this, this is the first questionable one uh, because of the nature of the explosion. But the Russians claim it was a um, some kind of uh, fertilizer uh, plant. 
But the really interesting part is that right next to this plant is a dam for the Dnieper River. And um, now there's speculation that they were really targeting the dam and they missed, or they were testing to see how good or how reliable the Russian air defense system would be. Now, the, the technique basically is to saturate the air with missiles and that some of them are going to go through. Uh, and you don't saturate them with just a, one kind of missile. So you saturate them with a Tochka U, a HIMAR. Now, one of the missiles was a HIMAR that took out this fa um, this saltpeter uh, factory that, that caused the explosion. However, two of the HIMAR missiles were intercepted. There was initially doubt whether uh, they could be intercepted, but then a few days later, another HIMAR was in, was intercepted, and the warhead was was captured because it was blown up in midair. Uh, the warhead fell had fallen down. It was like you see with the Tochka, you uh, big chunks of it fall down out of uh, out of the air. And then today I saw more proof of. Um, HIMARS being able to be taken down. So the Russians are uh, adapting to the use of HIMARS. Um, apparently, uh, the, now, I, I, at first I didn't believe it, but I'm starting to lean like it's probably true. Uh, there is There are rumors that uh, a HIMAR has been sold for 800,000 US to the Russians by the Ukrainians. Now, a lot of people won't believe if this, but anybody who's been following this war from 2014 onwards will tell you that, like, uh, a lot of the <laughs> the military material that even the Novorossians received uh, was literally, I mean, sometimes an entire battalion would switch sides, but they would sell this equipment that they were getting from the U.S. And we know that that happened with the French Caesar mobile cannons. And they're in Russia now. They're being examined. They're they're uh, they're looking at their tech. And I'm, and if the HIMARS story happens to pan out, then that'll mean that they're going to look into how the HIMARS system works. Uh, Biden has pledged uh, more howitzers and uh, more HIMARS. Um, I don't know if they got there. And then just an, about an hour and a half ago, two hours ago, there was a report that in northern Greece. A Ukrainian plane with military cargo on it had crashed uh, in a town just outside of the city of Kavala. So people, it was already in flames uh, before it crashed. And as it turns out, the pilot was saying they had engine failure and that they didn't expect to be able to uh, recover. So um, to continue, uh, documenting the war front. So if we move from south to east, um, there is some exchange and fighting uh, along the along the contact line of the south, um, particularly around Ugladar, but also uh, around Zaporozhye. Uh, more missile strikes there. Uh, Zaporozhye and um, Kharkov are always getting missile attacks. So it's not just places like Bakhmut, Slavyansk, um, Kramatorsk that are getting that are getting them. But uh, these other ones, even before Lysychansk was uh, was taken, have been receiving these hits from from the Russians. And uh, the one of the the, the siege uh, plant where they manufacture airplane engines, uh, you know, that has been hit. So in a way, Russia has already decided that, you know, we'd, it would have been nice uh, to have it, but uh, I guess we'll have to get rid of it if it means this, you know, destroying Ukrainian material that is coming from NATO countries. So uh, then in the thick of the fighting in Donbass, moving north from the east, uh, we have uh, the Russian troops and the deep the Donetsk People's Republics moving uh, much closer now uh, to Slavyansk. They are fighting on the east side of Seversk, uh, which is the town kind of like halfway between the Sichansk and Slavyansk. Um, 
Uh, from what I hear, yesterday the suburbs have been captured, and now they're they are further in. Other smaller towns have also been captured south of that region, and some indirect fighting and strikes are now going into the area that is the most fortified, Adivka. This is where most of the shelling that is hitting uh, civilians in Donetsk and Lugansk is coming from. Um, it's the most fortified. It is the place where, and it is like right next to Donetsk. It is unbelievably close. It's uh, like between Donetsk and Gorlovka. So uh, that that establishment is now basically it, it, there's the only way out is from the northwest, and it's it's closing. Uh, some of the roads leading uh, to Bakhmut have already been cut off. Uh, so I imagine probably by, you know, this is going to air Sunday, probably by Friday, some of these towns that I've mentioned now, they're already going to be taken. What happens afterwards is going to be very interesting. The president of Serbia, Vucic, uh, said that effectively after uh, Slavyansk, uh, Kramatorsk and Bakhmut fall, there's very little to stop the Russians from reaching to the Dnepr River. And that Putin is probably going to make some kind of a peace offering. And if the West refuses, there will be no choice but for him to press on. I think that's a pretty astute uh, analysis of probably what will happen. Um, I think he's right to say that the West w will refuse any negotiations. If they do, it'll simply be a stall tactic. Uh, you mentioned tanks. So um, Poland is ready to hand over another 240 tanks, and they will have about 125 of those replaced with some older Abrams. Um, Poland is very invested in this, sadly. <laughs> but I mean, given the history, I, I, it's also predictable. Because, you know, when this war started, there were a lot of countries that looked like, oh, my God, we've waited decades for this. Uh, you know, we've waited decades, not just like to make uh, Russian trees and tree growing competitions illegal or Russian cats and dogs illegal or uh, Russian athletes illegal. You know, we've we, we've been we've been waiting for this war for a very, very long time. And uh, and you can see that in, 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 in these countries, you know, the left and the right are united on, on the Russia question for the most part. There are more sane voices. Uh, of course, but for the most part, they that really did unite them, which is something that uh, has not really happened in um, in America. Yeah, and even in countries you don't expect, there are little holdouts. There were some anonymous Belarusian military commander saying that if Russia wins in Ukraine, the fight is going to have to be taken to Belarus next, and I might have to fight against the Russians in <laughs> my own country. Just this, uh, <laughs> this absolute cope from this unnamed mid-level Belarusian officer talking about how uh, they have a plan to overthrow Lukashenko and fight back against Russia. Just like, it was just entire screed that I don't even, it, it's not even worth being mentioned on the show beyond how yeah, absurd yeah, yeah. and honestly <laughs> laughable it is. But I, I figured yeah. I, I would bring that up just as a non-serious. It's good you brought it up. It, I remember seeing that. <laughs> yeah, as, as a non-serious aside, but on, on a more serious note, Putin has signed a decree that streamlines the process for Ukrainians to get Russian citizenship. Now, yes. you'll recall this has happened in waves before, where it was originally for those in the Donbass, he streamlined that process. Then, after the outbreak of the war in the areas that Russia asserted control over, such as uh, Kherson and the areas it was pushing into, it asserted that. But now it has extended to a streamlined process for all Ukrainians. <laughs> and given what you said, this could be part of, say, the the overture they're trying to make, the diplomatic outreach they're trying to make, like, U Ukrainians can become Russian citizens. One of the other big speculated things is, is so they can have local elements governed over the territories that they have placed under occupation since the outbreak of the war, so they can have local pro-Russian Ukrainians or ethnic Russians in U who are from Ukraine be in charge of administrating these annexed uh, 
oblast or provinces or uh, you know occupation zones I suppose they would be for now so that has been a new development uh, I wasn't expecting it but by no means is it surprising at all and again I generally agree that it's going to come down to Russia is going to try to make some diplomatic effort. Now, how earnest that is, is another question. I do believe we'll be somewhat earnest in the fact that we want to make an agreement with the bargaining chips we have, and we intend to keep quite a few, but we're willing to make some concessions if you're willing to be reasonable. The West will reject it wholesale because we have to support the front line of democracy in Ukraine, in which case Russia will take that as license to go even further than they already have now, and more or less again, across the country. I mean, when you look at the, the goals that were publicly set forth, in terms of demilitarizing Ukraine, despite how much aid is sent in, given the uh, amount of damage Ukrainian military assets have taken from this war, Ukraine has been effectively demilitarized. And at that point, if we're to believe that, like, you know, demilitarization and neutralization are the two main ones, which... I don't think that's the whole picture. It seldom is the official story of the whole picture. In fact, never is the official story of the whole picture. But after that, if Ukraine is able to accept some sort of pledge to neutrality, I mean, that's the accomplishment of the war goals. At this point, I think just taking the Donbass, whether that be in a full annexation or in terms of an aligned client state, isn't going to be enough, I think, just from popular support in Russia among the people and even among the political establishment, they're going to want to grab more from Ukraine. I know some of the projections at the beginning of the war was, oh, everything east of the Dnieper has to go to Russia in order for it to be a success, blah, blah, blah. Uh, I, I won't draw any exact lines, but I would say for certain that according to the Russian political establishment and Russian people, that there will have to be more concessions accepted from Ukraine and Ukraine be also being a proxy for the Western world at that point for the war effort to have been considered worth it on top of the hammering that they put on their military. So, overall, I can't tell you when this war is going to end. I can't tell you how this war is going to end. I can say, unless there is some sort of black swan event, Russia has effectively won this war. It's just a matter of what this victory will look like and how negotiations will pan out and how much fight the West still has in it. And really, and I think I know the answer to this question, I think you guys know the answer to the question, who can really win a war of attrition, who can whittle down who first, which I think Russia has the advantage, at least in this particular case, against the Western countries, especially European countries, in terms of who can weather more sanctions, weather more hardship, weather more of an economic crisis. Just, I mean, given... What we've seen since since the end of February of this year, if trends continue, I mean, it's certainly Russia. I don't think Europe's going to have some big energy boom of its own accord or f from abroad at, at this point. Whether they like it or not, Russia is their source of energy. And unless Europe wants to continue backsliding, it in particular is going to have to come to an agreement with Russia but that will have to be with the consent of the United States. And the question is, what will spurn on the United States to give said consent? Mm -hmm. And uh, because there are forces, even within the political establishment, who aren't too gung-ho about the support. That's not saying that they don't support Ukraine at all. But ones who aren't willing to put tooth and nail into Ukraine, it's become a thing of the Democratic Party and the holdouts of new conservatism within the Republican Party. In fact, there was actually an interesting story regarding a Republican lawmaker that was denounced by the GOP, a Republican lawmaker who is of a Ukrainian background who was denounced by the GOP for criticizing Zelensky and the internal political situation in Ukraine. So it was a Republican from Indiana, and who has traveled to Ukraine several times since the beginning of the war, who has criticized Zelensky and said that he is really just a showman, he's really just trying to increase his own self-interest and his own career, and that 
like most politicians, he is corrupt. So you, of course, had the Republican Party come out and say that, uh, oh, she doesn't know what she's talking about. Uh, she shouldn't say such a thing about allies. And the usual lines of defense they run when somebody comes out and say uh, says these sort of statements. So although war enthusiasm on the right side isn't non-existent, it's certainly markedly lower and could be used to slowly sweep it under, sweep the American involvement, sweep the full American dedication of Ukraine under the rug a little bit. So I think that's the case, and not us going back to Kissinger who said that at this point Ukraine is going to have to make concessions and the West is going to have to consent to those concessions in order for the situation to be stabilized in order for the global situation to be stabilized because knocking Russia off its pedestal is simply not going to happen. We're not going to collapse Russia because as we've seen over the past five months yet again, we don't have the capability to do that without committing to a full scale war. And in which case that would be far more too bloody to be worth it if we could even triumph in said war. Yes. Uh, well put. Um, which again, we always say this now, but it makes me wonder, uh, you know, at what cost will they try to prevent, um, from America losing any more relevance? You know, maybe, I, I don't know, there's all kinds of hypotheses one can come up with and say, well, you know, before, uh, the fall of the Soviet Union, you had, you know, this kind of ideology that ruled and, you know, China and Russia don't have that those ideologies anymore. Uh, they've been heavily modified. Uh, so maybe that's, uh, you know, that's a victory. And even if Russia is less relevant, uh, what they accomplished, um, ideologically speaking, is, um, is important. But um, ideologies need force uh, in order to uh, be convincing. And uh, I've often said it to to friends, including some Russian friends, when they've been skeptical about like the influence of um, you know American ideology or just Americanism. And I've said, uh, I said, don't worry. I said, um, the weaker the West looks, the more uninterested people will be in following it. So a lot of a lot of everything is based on success and power. Uh, it's people are far more Machiavellian than, than uh, are given credit for. And um, as I said at the beginning of the show, many of the tenets of wokeism, they're simply societal shivalifs for supporting the power, right? Like on the one hand, they take care of like a way of redeeming America. So America can't change the past. So the way it redeems itself is it finds new groups that it liberates, you know, uh, so then that is used as a counterbalance for all previous mistakes. It's, it's why, like, uh, you know, boomer shit libs uh, in my life, uh, you know, literally think that if America loses, they're going to live under a totalitarian regime. Like, chi like China will literally rule over them, uh, you know, even though America is like a, a nuclear power and still has like an incredible submarine fleet. Uh, like, it's just it's so preposterous. Um, and these are these are people. They make good money. Uh, that that I know. You know, they travel to all kinds of exotic places, and they literally believe this shit. Like, uh, I I don't know. I, I don't know what to say. But yes, well, um, I suppose after a certain point, it comes to the territory of living that kind of lifestyle, where if you are that enculturated, that ingratiating, that you really start to believe what you're fed. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I literally remember these people. Not strongly condemning Bush, but not being happy with them, not being happy with the wars, and all of, and as it always happens, all of that is forgotten. Uh, they, they will tell you about how they, um, liberalism contains self-correcting measures. It, it's 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 like another way of saying it's actually perfect. It's always working towards perfection, which is like literally one of the stupid. Uh, strains of Roussonianism within Enlightenment theory, right? That uh, the, the perfectibility of man, like it's so stupid. Uh, and then, and then it's just giga, it's giga scaled 
for for the entire society for the entire nation it, it's 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 uh, so obviously wrong <laughs> uh, and they never even believed in it in the way they believe in it now they literally sound like they're watching that guy Zakaria on CNN which I mentioned last week it's a, it's like the same talking points um, like. No, I mean, do you, it's like, do you have answers for like, what are you going to do with like this, you know, like economically Europe falling apart? Like, what what are you talking about? Like, that's not strength. Uh, Russia's literally depleting the Western, um, you know, Western military supplies. It's literally depleting them. And it was also pointed out to me in a conversation with, once again, somebody who would rather not be mentioned on the show, and I saw articles about this, about the decline in the arsenal of democracy that, compared to what America was, even in the non-aligned years of World War II, even in 1939, 1940, the industrial capacity to mass-produce military equipment, whether that be actual weapon systems like tanks, planes, helicopters, or just logistical things or supply things has so greatly decreased because of the contractor system we have right now because the way the government awards bids and a lot of that is due to uh, personal favors rather than any actual, say, competency or whoever fits the bill for the job best as opposed to somewhere like Russia or China which has a much more state-managed military industry and while that does come with, of course, some similar corruption problems, it's easier to put down a party line, it's easier to put down a course of action and say, okay, we're going to manufacture this, this, and this because we need this, this, and this, rather than saying, well, okay, who's going to bid the lowest on this, and how are you going to do it, and what's your plan, and uh, what's the time frame, and you want how much from us for that, and you're going to add a few extra zeros in the contract because whatever bureaucrats looking over this is going to conveniently not pay attention to the extra 10 zeros you tacked on the end. Things like that where it's become so much more bloated within the U.S. to the point where state-directed industry in a even just semi-competent country can blow this uh, so-called market system out of the water when you consider all these other factors and touching once again on the conversation we were having last on last week's show regarding state planned economies versus market economies and that there really is no true market economy left in the world, at least not since the 1930s, 1940s, and I would argue even further than that, where it comes a matter of while there is on the surface competition, while there is on the surface these bids or whatever, well, number one, all these people are in bed together, and number two, it becomes just a matter of inefficiency, a matter of how much can we milk out of it. Not not saying that any system is immune from those flaws, but when you have a state-directed industry for something as vital as military production in a country with the kind of martial tradition as Russia, and once again, that's not to say that the U.S. doesn't have its own strong martial tradition, that I would argue, is being rapidly depleted. One system clearly has triumphed over the other when it comes to that, where to the point where, just judging by results, you can't really argue with the results, that the American industry, when it comes to the, you know, massive military-industrial complex is becoming more sluggish and less efficient and not able to crank out arms the rate it used to be, and certainly not able to crank out arms the rate that we need to send them somewhere like, say... Uh, Ukraine or any other proxy battlefield that may crop up within the next 10 to 20 years. Right, and people don't have to take our word for it. I mean, you can read the articles. Uh, some of what we're talking about is based on the articles we've already read in the last few months from the War Institute, from that um, the, the British um, the, the British institution that's like Ross something. Um, they're all talking about being surprised at the industrial capacity of Russia in this war. And, uh, you know, the real shame of it is, is now, like, Ukraine's best fighters are already dead. They're, like, they're about 80 to 70 percent de depleted. And this is 
why you're seeing more restrictions on young men. Uh, they're not allowed to leave the, the cities and towns that they're living in. I saw photos from um, from Zaporozhia and Dnepr where like there are queues of cars leaving the city. This um, one Ukrainian recruiter is saying, "Look at them! They're all they're all abandoning Ukraine. They're all they're all leaving." I mean, like obviously it's not working. You haven't you haven't retaken any territory, right? Like all the victories are, you know, they're mean victories on Twitter. Um, they're small tactical victories, but substantively, you have not been able to re-liberate another city anywhere. Like, and it's been a war that's been going on for six months. Uh, realistically, I think casualties, I think KIA for, for, for Ukrainians is well in excess of 20,000 well in excess of that we may never find out but it's it's a lot i think the current um, estimation is an average of about 600 a day now up from about the 500 something that was just in a yeah. few weeks ago i mean i don't know who knows i mean um two two three hundred dead and another four five hundred uh wounded and injured who aren't going to return to the battlefield anytime soon that to me seems very, very plausible, right? And you have to take into account like all these um, barracks that the Russians are destroying, right? Uh, where many, many, many are dying all at once. Um, so I think, you know, um, the other thing of course is, you know, the last show, uh, I guess before we, we wrap up Ukraine is, the million man army that was going to retake Kherson has uh, has been canceled. Uh, the, the the Ukrainian military uh, chief has said that there was a, a misunderstanding uh, that um, uh, his English is not that good and uh, uh, Western media has misunderstood what he said. So, like again, this is what I mean. Um, they have to win like meme wars in order to con in order for uh, the West to continue to send more financial aid, more military aid, uh, to keep the morale of the war going. Um, and, and so this, these are delay tactics to keep the inevitable from, from happening. Um, and in a sense, uh, I mean, all the parties in the West are interested in keeping the inevitable from happening, because when it does, it will be, like I said, even before the invasion happened, it will be the, the one of the greatest humiliating points of the West in decades, in many, many decades, uh, people won't even remember Afghanistan. And Afghanistan, for many, was a shock in the way that was handled. Um, so, you know, an event like this in about a year after Afghanistan, that's going to be shocking. Yes, and on top of all of that, there has been the order of evacuation of all American nationals from yes, Ukraine and that. the evacuation of diplomatic personnel as well because they do fear that the war is going to escalate even further and they want to pull out any Americans for whatever reason that might still be in the country at this point. Uh, now, it was mainly, if you read it, targeted towards diplomatic and government-affiliated officials, but... Just any Americans that might be in Ukraine have been advised to get the hell out of there in no uncertain terms. Right. And that lends credence to, I think, what Vucic is saying. When you when you combine what Vucic is saying, the attack on Venezia that, 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 that took out all those officers, I think you're beginning to understand, because there were apparently foreign advisors there. You know, these aren't just redditor uh, c combatants uh, who've joined and got blown up in a in a barracks attack. Uh, you know, these are these are probably some high level advisors that you know we're not going to find out their names um, or the CIA or MI6. So there, there there's going to be a certain level of anonymity forever or for many many decades, um, depending on how the the world is. Uh, in those decades. So, um, yeah, that is, um, that is interesting. 
say the least, but that is all I had for this episode. If you have any last minute things that we have left off, I will leave it to you. If not, I will go ahead and bring the show to a full close. Uh, I'll just mention, as I said, off air. Uh, so some development developments in North Macedonia. Uh, there have been protests and riots there, but it was, you know, I mean, North Macedonia, like so many of uh, these little countries, um, has an elite that's completely bought out. And in Macedonia's case, they have a um, a uh, a minority that is always working against their interests. So. Uh, Macron last week made a proposal to accept the Bulgarian demands for joining the EU, and the government has capitulated. Uh, overwhelming support for, of the from the Albanians. Uh, the stipulations are as such that um, um, essentially uh, Macedonians are really Bulgarians. They don't really necessarily say that, uh, but they say that the the language is derivative. It, it is. There's, there's no question, but it has other influences. And uh, that, you know, historically, it has to give a nod to uh, to Bulgaria if they want to join. But there's a cascading effect uh, that I've seen from this. And now there are uh, Albanian sources that are saying Albania's ascension into the EU is uh, now cleared as well. Um, they, they saw this as some kind of an obstacle uh, in relation to North Macedonia. And now that this is resolved, they will ascend. Thing I have to ask, however, is what you know, what EU, what is going to be left of the EU? Like they're still clamoring to join the EU, but what's going to be left of it? <laughs> well, I suppose that's why they're trying to get in now and get their piece of the pie before it all falls apart. <laughs> yeah, get the money. <laughs> they're not going to get any money. It's like. Oh my God. Well, but they might get more Albanians, more diversity. <laughs> that's that's and that's more right. valuable than any amount of money ever could be. You know, you have a point. <laughs> but that is all I have that, for this episode. Um, so thank you, everyone, for tuning in, and uh, my dog thanks you as well. She is currently begging <laughs> to come in the room. In which case, I will allow her in once we uh, finish up recording. But thank you, everyone, for tuning in. We will see you guys next time, and goodbye. Thank you, and goodbye.